So Felton and Heston, um, most people will probably be familiar with Felton Remand Centre or Felton Young Offenders Centre and the Heston Services on the M4. Um, we actually, we've got a lot more to offer than that. So it's a very, very multicultural society. We have some uh, great restaurants, obviously, due to the fact that we have such a kind of melting pot of, of people from everywhere. Um, we have a lot of history, you know. Um, we, we, have, we have actually, it was London's first airport was here. We had Zeppelins landing here um, back in those days. We now have on the site where the Spitfires used to be made, some of the Spitfire parts, we have the largest Bollywood cinema outside of India. And we have, um, yeah, like I say, it's, it's a real mix. So we have, we have an old house that we were trying to save. You know, it's like 200 years old. I'm just going to Rack and Ruin, Hanworth Park House. Um, there's a lot of people involved in that. Um, but yeah, it is, it's actually quite a nice place to live. Um, it, it borders, for those that don't know, it's in the borough of Hounslow, London Borough of Hounslow, but it also borders Surrey. So to the west of the constituency where I live, it's slightly more rural. Um, Hanworth Village, the, the ward itself, does have a villagey kind of feel at the weekend. You know, there's not so much traffic. But as you move east in towards Hounslow West and Heston, this is where we get more of the um, ethnic minorities. You know, and we get we get the Indian restaurants um, and the Polish restaurants and that kind of thing over there, and the Romanians and those guys as well. So, so yeah, it's, it's a real mix. And obviously, um, the home to Freddie Mercury and Robert Plant. So. Yeah, that's quite cool. The London Borough of Hounslow is split into two constituencies. We have um, Feltman Heston, where I'm standing, and then we have Brentford and Isleworth, which is the other constituency. Now, Brentford and Isleworth is a little bit more upmarket. You know, they have places like Chiswick. Uh, they spent a lot of money in Brentford recently, uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of redevelopment. And it seems that they, they don't want to spend anything over here, you know, in our constituency. So, for example, we have the problems that a lot of people have got, such as the potholes, the weeds growing out of the road, streetlights not working, graffiti, vandalism, that kind of thing. And that's, you know, if there was no money, I could kind of understand. But you go over to Chiswick last year. I mean, this was, I don't read it, but it was in the Daily Mail. Um, £50,000 for a rainbow crossing. You know, now I'm not anti LGBTQ, but there were there were gay people that were saying this is ridiculous. Why are you spending fifty thousand pounds on a on a rainbow crossing when we have all these problems? You know, and that's them in their constituency. And we don't we don't see any of this over, over, over on our side. Yet we pay the same sort of uh, amounts of council tax. So that's one of the challenges we've got. Obviously, trying to get the funding from Hounslow Council. Um, but we shouldn't be in this position, you know. Um, it was at Hustings last night that the Labour MP couldn't be bothered to turn up to. So they sent the leader of Hounslow Council. And he actually said, um, after the central area of London, Hounslow, with the Heathrow Airport just there, we've got the second biggest economy in London. We shouldn't be having these problems, you know. So, yeah. I, 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 the, I, I, if you ask me what the major problem is, what the crux of it is, it's because we've got a Labour MP and a Labour council, and we're in the middle of a, a Labour-run London. And when you've got a, an MP that wants to be <clears throat> wants to be a minister, as you should shadow minister now, she's not going to criticise the Labour Party. Yeah, so the Labour candidate, and I'm going to have to be careful here because it was very widely known um, that she was living in a £10 million house in Chelsea. Okay, on a road called the Vale. She's married to a very, very successful multi-millionaire um, investment banking guy. But she's insisting on all of her literature that coming through the door that she lives in Heston. So either she's lying or I am very much mistaken and so are all the newspapers. Because if you Google Seema Malhotra, Chelsea, you know, at least a couple of years ago she was she was living in this house. Um, so I wouldn't have thought she would move from a £10 million pound house back to Heston for no apparent reason. But there you go. So that's the Labour one. Um, actually, in interestingly, I was the first independent candidate to declare that I was standing. So I declared back in December that I was standing, which I then reaffirmed at the No Ceasefire, No Vote conference in London, uh, that I was standing, and I, I confirmed that from the floor when I spoke. Um, but since then, we've had the Workers' Party candidate uh, decided to stand. Now, 
This is a guy called Amrit Palman. Now, he was a Labour councillor for 30 years. Okay. Now, what he did is he left Labour, joined the Workers' Party. Now, I have nothing against the Workers' Party. Anyway, he, he joined the Workers' Party. And I sent him an email and I said, look, I see what you're doing. You've resigned and all that. I'll just let you know that I've long established that I'm going to be standing. Blah, blah, blah. Now, he's saying he resigned from the council uh, over Palestine and what's been going on in Gaza. <clears throat> but, you know, this guy's been a councillor for 30 years. Okay, he hasn't resigned yet. So I'm trying to wonder, you know, has he just heard about Palestine? Or was the death toll in previous operations not enough to warrant him resigning from the Labour Party? I mean, you're talking 2017, you're talking 2014. We had, I think it was Protective Edge, Operation Protective Edge, that massacred a whole load of Gazans. Um, 2008, we had Operation Cast Lead. And obviously we've had killing every day in between all of those operations. You know, they're like fish trapped in a barrel. Um, and also, this is the party that he was a councillor when Tony Blair decided to invade Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he decides that hey, I really care about Gaza, you know, I really care about Palestine. I'm going to resign from Labour. Probably more like it was a guy. You know, I say a rat, but a guy leaving a sinking ship. Yeah, fleeing a sinking ship is what I'm probably thinking is happening here because. Could have resigned at any time. And NACPA has been going on for over 70 years. You've been a councillor for 30 of those years. Um, yeah, so then we have, um, uh, he lives in Southall. So he doesn't actually live in our constituency either, along with Labour MP. The Conservative MP, she is a GP. And again, she does not live in our area. She lives in Harlington, which is um, about two constituencies over. The Liberal Democrat, although he claims to live in the Hanworth area, which is where I live in the constituency. Um, he actually lives across the border in the London borough of Richmond upon Thames in a little place called Hampton, um, which is a little bit deceptive of him to be saying he lives in the Hanworth area. Because that's kind of like, I don't know, that's kind of like looking at the solar system and saying that the moon is in the Earth's area, right? Yeah, he, he, it's not on Earth, but it's in the Earth's area. So that's a little bit deceptive of that guy. And I'll be honest with you, he is a career politician. I have an email from him. Uh, he asked me to step down, step aside, help him, um, even though he acknowledges he's got no chance of winning. So he knows he's not going to win, but he would like me to step aside. And the reason is because if he gets a lot of votes, and this is what I've got an email, I can see the emails here. If he gets a lot of votes, the Lib Dems might put him in a better place next time. And if he does good there, then potentially the third time they might put him somewhere where he can win. Now, if that's not a career politician... I don't know what is. So obviously I've told him where to go. I'm, I'm not going to stand aside. Why would I? Why would you ask someone to stand aside when you know you've got no chance of winning? Um, the reform candidate, uh, Pradeep Singh, he he lives in Reading. And for those that don't know the UK or particularly don't know the country, um, Reading's down like a motorway, right? Like a, a freeway, about 30 miles away. There are so many, so many constituencies in between my constituency and where the reform candidate's coming from. So, again, I would question anybody's motives that is not standing in their own constituency. Now, I think I think it should be a law. I think you should have to live where you're standing, right? So the reason I'm standing is because I care about my community. I care about the world and the country as well, right? But I care about my community, and this is why I'm standing here. I haven't chosen to stand somewhere else. Why are these guys not standing in their community? Now, you know, I've, I've explained a little bit about Felton and Heston, right? It, it, it must sound great, right? Because it is a really cool place. I, I love Felton and Heston. But I'm not so beguiled as to think that we are so great that these people from really far away want to come here and represent us just because we're, we're just such lovely people, you know? That's not what they're doing. They're career politicians. Um, we have another independent candidate standing called um, Abdul Majid Trambu. Now... Again, I don't want to make accusations, but it seems very strange to me that I declared in December I'm a long-term Palestine activist. You know, I've taken part in uh, a lot of activism. I've occupied buildings, uh, arranged protest vigils, uh, demonstrations. We've done massive banner drops. Um, we've done a lot of stuff online. Um, I'm very well known for supporting Palestine. Um, and, you know, I'm going to kind of need that vote if... if, if we're going to win here and we're going to beat Labour, okay? And it just very, it seems very strange that a week before the nomination's closed, this guy decides to announce that he's standing. Now, 
He's standing purely on Gaza. He's got no other policies whatsoever. That strikes me as a little bit weird because you know you're not going to win just on that one on that one policy. But you would take a lot of votes away from a candidate that's already declared that they're standing <clears throat> and already has a proven history and track record of supporting Palestine. So that just strikes me as really weird. It's possibly just been put up by Labour. But, you know, I can't say one way or the other. That's just what, what I believe would make sense for them to do. Uh, yeah, and then we have um, we have a, 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 another guy standing as a candidate. There's actually 10 candidates, believe it or not, standing here. It's like, uh, yeah, more than a by-election. It's like a whole circus going on. Um, we have another guy standing. Yeah, he's a white English guy. don't know him, uh, Ian, Ian Brown. Um, and then we have another lady standing, um, a Muslim lady, Chowdhury, Mr. Chowdhury. She's done absolutely no campaigning. She's got no leaflets. No one's ever heard of her. Uh, she announced on the day that the nominations closed that she would also be standing as independent. So, yeah, I don't know why these independents are standing when they're not actually doing any, any real work. It's kind of a little bit bizarre. So it does lead me to be a little bit paranoid as to as to the motives for, the, for these guys standing, you know. But, yeah, anyway, they, that's that's... That's the rundown of our candidates. Not wrong side. Look, look. Same difference. Um, you know, they're supposed to be the opposition. What are they opposing? They've opposed nothing. It's like, you know, that their policies are almost identical now to, to the Conservatives. There was a guy, I believe uh, his name is uh, Ian Caldwell. I might be wrong. He was a big, big Tory donor. And he said today, I saw it on social media, he gave an interview and he said, now that Starmer has removed all of the left from the party, I can now endorse them. That's what he said, you know, and if you look, it's not just him. There are a lot of Tory donors that have now switched to Labour. And um, for anyone who knows, it's the, usually the, the donors, the, the lobbyists that, that, that control what the policy ends up being. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was in Labour. Uh, I was in the Labour Party until just after Keir Starmer took over. Um, I mean, I saw what was coming. A lot of us saw what was coming. There was people tearing up their membership cards and sending them back. Um, and I would just wonder, I wonder why. I just can't get my head around why people are still in the party. You know, it's just like, oh, well, well maybe they're hoping something will change. And I mean, it's just being, I don't want to disrespect anyone, but it's a little bit naive, you know. It's, it's, uh, you need a party. If you're going to have a party, you need to have a party that can't be changed. It needs to be written into the Constitution that the party will always stand for everything that was in their very first manifesto forever. And that needs to be written into the Constitution to stop any party from being changed in the future. Um, the guy that, that started Labour, uh, Keir Hardy, who ironically Keir Starmer is named after, um, Keir Hardy, who started the Labour Party, would not recognise the Labour Party that exists today. Um, and I think it's a real shame that, you know, these parties get started with all the best intentions and then they can be taken over and changed. So, which is obviously what's what's happened with, with, with the Labour Party. I have a manifesto, actually. Um, it's a 91 pledge manifesto. There's 91 policies in this manifesto um, that are very innovative. You know, they're, they're unique. They don't exist in anyone else's manifestos. But more on a local level, um, what I'm going to be doing, the actual pledges that are on my leaflets that are going out. So, for example, um, <clears throat> I'm not knocking on anyone's doors. Okay, I'm putting leaflets through people's doors, train stations, schools, Everyone's getting one leaflet off me through the Royal Mail free uh, mail shop service. Um, so I've had over 60,000 leaflets printed and will be delivered. Um, but yeah, I'm not knocking on anyone's doors because like, they're busy. People have been at work all day, right? They're trying to cook. They're trying to look after the kids. They might be in the bath or the toilet. You know, they don't want to be coming to the door because someone's there asking for a favor. But one of my policies is if I get elected, I'll be knocking on 10 doors at random each week. So through the week, I'll be going out just knocking on 10 doors when people are home saying, look, no, there's no election coming up. Don't worry. It's fine. Uh, uh, have you got any problems with anything? You know, is there anything you need to be done? Because 
You don't see them. When was the last time your MP knocked on your door or someone from their party or any party without asking for something? You know, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, one of my other policies uh, is that, so I work uh, as a heavy goods driver and I'm quite lucky. I have no qualifications. I left school. I was in care for most of my life. I left school with no qualifications. I'm quite lucky to have um, a very well paid job uh, driving trucks. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is if elected, I'm going to be donating £22,000 a year from um, the MP salary to my local community. What that will mean is after tax, I take home exactly the same as what I take home now. So I will be no better off, but I won't be any worse off. <clears throat> and I'll be honest, it's, it's a privilege and it should be an honour to be selected by your community to represent them. You know, I mean, that is that, 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 what an honour that is, right? For people to choose you out of everyone else to be their voice. And if I could do it for free, I would do it for free. But everyone has bills to pay. So, as I said, I'm not doing it for myself. I've never said I'm doing this for myself. I've actually taken a month off work. Like I'm in so much debt now, it's unreal through, through, through the deposit, the leaflets, not going to work because I'm campaigning. Really, really not doing this for myself. So that £22,000 will be going to action groups in the area, you know, people to keep the parks clean and help the scouts, you know, if they're having uh, fun days or whatever they're doing. In the summer, we can hire coaches. We can take the kids down to the seaside, you know, just get them off the estates. Um, all kinds of things like that. So, um, yeah, that's the two of my policies for that for, for affect the local area most. Um, we have a thing in London. It's So a lot of people are scared we're going to be getting this policy coming from pay per mile where we're going to be charged to, to, to drive our cars per mile. And as I've explained, you know, part of our constituency is quite, well, it's not rural, but it's kind of spread out, you know, and people need their cars, especially disabled people, people with disabled children. Um, the schools aren't all on top of each other like you've got in the city, you know, where you just walk around the corner and the school's there. You have to you have to use an unreliable bus service or drive to the school. Um, so Sadiq Khan has said he's not going to bring in this pay per mile, okay? But if you know Sadiq Khan, then you know Sadiq Khan, okay? It probably means we are going to have pay per mile. Um, and our current Labour MP is not going to stand up against the Labour mayor. So again, locally, that policy is is very important to a lot of people where I live. But on a national level, um, I want to suspend, uh, we want to suspend arms sales to anybody that's in breach of the Geneva Convention. Um, want to, I want to, there to be a bill that prohibits people from working or doing business with companies that are in occupied territories. I want to see um, <clears throat> an inquiry led by the British Crown Prosecution Service into aiding and abetting of war crimes by uh, British ministers, British officials, and the board members of arms companies who know that these weapons are being used to indiscriminately murder children, women and men, uh, but yet they're still sending these weapons out. So that's what I would like to see on that front. Um, and the recognition of Palestine. So back in, I think it was 2014 or 15, we had a vote to recognize Palestine. And I and a lot of people worked very hard on that. Um, building uh, uh, email databases so people could email their MPs and urge them to vote to recognise Palestine. Um, so that's already been voted for by the British Parliament. We've already voted to do that. Local economy is very much based on Heathrow Airport. Um, so obviously there are a lot of people that are against the expansion of Heathrow Airport. There's a lot of people that are in favour of, you know, of, of it. So they were looking to build a third runway a few years ago. That was shelved because of COVID. Um, Heathrow employs like 90,000 people in this area, and I believe they're the country's biggest private employer. Um, obviously, uh, the, the problem that you've got with that is the emissions, you know, and I live under the flight path. We're very lucky today that they're not actually flying over because it does, you know, I'd have to have all the windows shut and you would still hear it. Um, but yeah, we do have a problem with jobs, you know, and we've, we've got a lot of kids that are leaving school and there's no other opportunities for them. You know, this. I don't understand why when we've got such big employers. <clears throat> um, and then there are other, other people employed indirectly, of course, by the airport. Uh, yeah, so employment. Um, we also have terrible roads. The, the roads around here are absolutely disgusting, as I explained before. Uh, it's just a general degradation. You know, we've got so much vandalism, graffiti going on. And what that does is that drags the children's aspirations down because they believe that they're from somewhere 
where they should act a certain way, you know, they're from kind of like a, a rundown area and there's no hope for them. Whereas if you bring a child up in an area that's more leafy and clean and everything's kept well, they have higher aspirations. It's a proven, you know, they've done this. It's a scientific thing, you know, they've carried out research. and um, Yeah, it's not just your parents or your money or whatever. When you grow up in, a, in an area that's nicer and it's not just all concrete and graffiti and everything, you kind of identify as something like, you know what I mean? It's like you identify, you can achieve more. You identify with uh, people that you see that achieve more as opposed to people that you've seen on TV that are kind of in gangs, hanging around in a place that looks like your rundown area, you know? So, yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, accounts will just abandon this. You know, every answer I give you is probably going to be based on the fact that Hounslow Council just don't care. It's as simple as that, you know? It's a very, 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 very safe Labour seat um, in terms of councils. Councils have got, it's, it's, it's only over in Chiswick and that, where they have some conservative uh, count, councillors. It's probably the reason why they're spending more over there, because they're trying to court the vote from over that side, from back from the conservatives. Over here, they know that the people are going to vote Labour. Uh, but things are changing. You know, um, two years ago, we got our first, don't want to sound too happy about this, we actually got a conservative councillor elected here for the first time ever. You know, in this side of the, the bar, right, this side of the, the constituency, they've elected, we've elected, a, well, I didn't, but you know, people who live near me, they've elected a Conservative councillor. Because this is our sick day of Labour. Um, and again, so I'm hoping this is going to replicate through to the general election now, because we know that two years ago they were sick of Labour and they, they've elected a Conservative councillor for the first time ever. What well, I need to elect someone who's not a Labour MP, someone that can put pressure on the council, someone that wants to put pressure on the council, someone that doesn't mind going to the press and saying, look, this is what's happening here, someone that doesn't mind making full-on proper complaints to the local government ombudsman, you know, people that don't mind standing up in Parliament in the House of Commons and saying Hounslow Council is neglecting its residents, you know, blah, blah, this is the problem here, this is that, this is that, Labour are terrible, Labour are rubbish. Because Seema Malhotra, the Labour MP, is never going to stand up in the House of Commons and go, this Labour council is disgusting. So, yeah, I mean, if people really in, in the Belmont and Heston area want to help improve their area, they should do one thing for two reasons. They should vote for me, one, because I'm not Labour and I will stand up for them, and two, because I live here. And this is where my family live. It's where I've grown up. It's where my daughter lives. And I hopefully one day my grandchildren will live. And I have a vested interest in making sure that this community is as, as, as great and as nice as it can be, you know, and that everyone gets on and we have a, a cohesive society um, where everyone enjoys each other's company. We don't have any uh, tensions, you know, and, and, and it just looks nice. And, we, we, you know, we've got nice trees and foliage rather than concrete everywhere. And, you know, if I live here, it's clear that I want to improve my area, even if I'm selfish. Imagine, let's imagine I'm really selfish and I want to improve the area because I live here. Okay, anyone else that lives here is also going to benefit from that. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I can't actually show you at the moment, unfortunately, but um, let me see if I can. I have, I have a tiny little car. And we have a massive uh, box on the top of it with, with my signs on. Um, I don't know if I can show you that. So this is my this is my battle bus. I don't know if you can see that. So <laughs> I drive that around, and I have a few campaign songs that we're playing out. So one of them is uh, "Take a Chance on Me" by ABBA. Uh, one of them is "I'll Be There for You," the theme tune to Friends. Um, and we have Get Up, uh, Stand Up For Your Rights by Bob Marley. Um, yeah, so this basically, they're, they're advertising on hoardings and stuff like that. They want £1,700 to advertise at Felton Station for the week, for the election week on every hoarding in Felton train station. But you could park your car there, you could park that car there for a month for £132. It's a no-brainer, right? Who's not smart enough to be an MP? Um and then when they put their ones down the road, I can go and park in front of them. 
Um, but yeah, the, the main reason that my campaign is different to everybody else's, I guess, is just simply because I'm not a politician. Um, yeah, they're all going after the same thing. They all want careers. You know, I'm a, I'm a 49 year old lorry driver. Okay. Putting on my CV that I stood as a parliamentary candidate in UK elections does nothing for me. Yeah. If I go for a job as a lorry driver, which I've been doing for 22 years and I go, Oh, look, I stood as an MP. They go, well, so what? That's completely irrelevant to this industry, you know? So I, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I'm different because I'm possibly the only person that's not standing for myself. Uh, just well, maybe just a couple of things. Um, for example, you know, if you're thinking uh, of voting Labour, you probably don't need to think of your own area. We know Labour are going to win by a landslide. Okay, um, the polls are saying they're going to get something at the moment. The last poll I saw was 452 seats. Um, you could get a, on that basis, you could get a hundred independents elected, and the Tories still wouldn't win. You know, you could get 150 elected, and the Tories wouldn't win, and Labour wouldn't win. You know, based on those figures that are out in the polling. And I would question why people would want to vote Labour anyway and why you would want to vote for Labour just to get the Conservatives out. I mean, don't forget, we voted in Labour. Uh, we voted in the Conservatives in 2010 to get rid of Labour. And we voted Labour in, in 1997 to get rid of the Conservatives. And we voted the Conservatives in 1979 to get rid of guess who? Labour, and this has been going on for like a hundred years, right? And you, you get Labour saying, "Oh, the Tories, this, the Tories, that, the, the country's wrecked." Blah 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 blah. I'm sorry, but you have been in government, and when you haven't been the government, you have been the official opposition over a hundred years. Okay, now we all know that this country, we all know that this country is broken. Okay, every single part of this country is broken. And the reason that every single part of this country is broken is because the part of it that's supposed to stop things from getting broken, is supposed to repair things when they are broken, is broken itself, okay? And that is the government, yeah? And the reason it is, is because it's become this gravy train. It's become a place where people go to um, improve their own careers, you know? Years back, the idea of democracy was that every person from, the, from, from across the land would pick one person and send them down to speak on their behalf. You know, now, like I've, I've, I've said to you earlier, a lot of the candidates aren't even from this area. You know, it's, they're just doing it for themselves. And the greatest thing would be, right, is if we wake up on the 5th of July and we find out that Parliament is actually filled with the people that it was intended to be filled with, okay, people that are there to represent their communities, um, what, what an amazing thing that would be, okay? And they, they trick us. They trick us, Ed, man. They trick us, right? They, they perform this charade, this good cop, bad cop, two-party routine, okay? Like, you've got to vote for me because the other guy's really nasty, yeah? It's the same puppeteers operating these puppets. You've got, a, you've got a red puppet and a blue puppet, and it's the same people with their hands up there inside the puppets, right? You know? It, that, don't, why are you voting for Keir Stump? They're the same, right? Replacing Rishi Sunak with Keir Starmer is the same as changing your tyre when you've shut your pants. Okay? Why? What are you doing? Don't wake up on July the 5th to five more years of politicians, whether that's Raj, Sunak, Starmer, whatever. They're all politicians. The only people that aren't politicians are independents. Okay, and you know that independents aren't doing it for themselves because they can't get promoted. An independent can never become a minister, a foreign minister, a home secretary, a prime minister. Okay, anyone that wants to progress like that and isn't doing it for their community, they join a party. Okay, and they keep their mouth shut when people ask them to vote for a ceasefire. Okay, because they don't want to fall out with their party. Yeah, an independent isn't there for themselves. Okay, so why, after all these independents, 451 independents, I believe, have put themselves up this year, put a lot of money into it, they've put a lot of time and effort into it, and all they're asking is for people to just, like, put a little bit of faith in the system and go and vote, you know? It's 
people go on about, oh, you know, we should have a revolution. And uh, and everyone imagines that a revolution is supposed to be violent. Okay? But, Ed, it's not supposed to be violent. Hey, a revolution, the pen is mightier than the sword. That's what they say, right? The pen is mightier than the sword. Okay, so you use your pen, and on July the 4th, go into the voting booth and vote for independent, okay? There you've got your revolution. When you wake up on July the 5th, all the politicians will be gone. You know, they'll be sacked. Because I'll tell you something, Ed, if I didn't do my job, how my employer wanted me to do it, okay, he'd have words with me. And if I carried on saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to let's vote for a ceasefire, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I get sacked. Because I'm not doing the job how my employer wants me to do it. And we're their employers, and I think people forget that, you know? And they talk about things like, the corridors of power, right? Everyone's heard this expression, the corridors of power. And everyone assumes that the corridors of power are kind of like oak lined with a green carpet and pictures of idiots on the walls, yeah? But that's not the real corridors of power. The real corridors of power exist in our hospitals and in our schools and our universities and our colleges and our offices and our factories. They're the real corridors of power because we have the power to remove them and that is the ultimate power. So go out on July the 5th Vote independent, and let's just get rid of these people forever. They can go and get a normal job. They can go and drive buses or uh, something like that. I don't know. They can drive my lorry. Make me the MP, and they can go and drive my lorry.